So far, I have spoken of the ion fields that monitor the body as far as what it does or doesn't need and how it extends six inches from the fingers, can go through plastic and glass. I've talked about the fields that cause the, the muscles of the hand to unconsciously move clockwise or counterclockwise, and this is what causes a pendulum to move. I've spoken of the collector field that, that gathers in uh, negatively charged ions and the distributor field or the tracking field that sends them out toward a destination also through this unusual tube of energy can the thoughts and impulses from the sender go through and we talked about the morphic field the, that surrounds um, carbon-based objects of similar composition and allows them to share similar thoughts or impulses as you see in, in uh, birds or fish that are moving in real tight schools. I talked also about the orb. But the question is, is this supernatural? Basically, Something that is supernatural is a force that is beyond scientific understanding. Therefore, it is on a sliding scale according to what science does or does not understand. The more science understands, the fewer things are attributed to being supernatural. So, in essence, there is no supernatural, just a scientific dedication to ignorance. Now that may sound like a harsh thing to say, but there's a, more truth to it than we actually wish to admit. For example, I have a, had a lot of people tell me over the years that they, they really don't care what I find as far as like the tracking fields, you know, with my pendulum. And, and granted, the, the pendulum looks really hokey. It looks stupid. It looks very far-fetched. And I wouldn't believe it myself unless, except for the fact that I've had 30 years of testing it out. and. I've had confirmation after another, one after another, that it works, especially when I'm testing out batteries and, you know, you find the ones that are dead and the ones that are, that are powered up. But people will tell me that they will not believe like the tracking fields. They won't believe that those exist unless they see it with scientific instrumentation. Well, my question is, why doesn't science make instruments to detect these fields? And the answer is, they're not going to make the instruments to detect the fields because they don't believe the fields exist. And the reason they don't believe the fields exist is because they haven't made the instruments to detect the fields. And they're not going to make the fields, the uh, instruments to detect the fields because they don't believe the fields exist and they don't believe the fields exist because they haven't made the instruments. Now that sort of self-defeating circular logic, like being stuck in the mud, is really a dedication to ignorance. I work so much with these fields that the uh, morphic and tracking field that I find it absolutely ridiculous that science doesn't even try to replicate it and to detect the fields. I and mean, you take two objects like this, now they can even be like a glass of water with a little baking soda in it or two glasses of pop or two glasses of coffee. As long as they're similar, you can set them close to each other and because they're not touching, I'm going to use my pendulum and go for the morphic field. It's right there. And let's go around it. There it is. There's the morphic field and it has different physics, physic properties than the uh, tracking field. But there it is. So if a scientist would just put two carbon-based objects of similar composition close to each other like that, the morphic field will form. They just have to find uh, instruments that will detect the morphic fields. Now if you want to go to the tracking field, all you do is move this a little further away. And we've got, I'm going for the morphic field. The morphic field is no longer there because they're not close enough. And between them, there's the tracking field. So it's not hard to replicate. You know, just move the two objects further apart because they will, as a default, they will track objects of similar composition. And so a scientist just has to get some instrumentation in there to try, try to figure out what that field is made of that runs between them. Or if you want to get really fancy, 
There we go. We're going to fool Mother Nature into thinking that this is a flock of Cheetos here. Okay, let's see what we get with our flock of Cheetos. Morphic field. There we go. There's the morphic field. It's that easy to replicate. To fool Mother Nature into throwing these fields out there. Okay, now let's take our flock of Cheetos here and let's send one out as a stray. We have morphic field for this flock. There's the morphic field and we would have the tracking field that would run between them. It's that easy to replicate. So it just makes me shake my head and that science doesn't even care enough to get out their instruments and, and try to figure out what those fields are. Really, it, it, science does have a dedication to ignorance. If you take a deeper look at modern science, you'll find out it's not as impressive as they want you to think it is. For example, Rupert Sheldrake wrote a book, and in England it's entitled The Science Delusion. Now, the American version of it has a more positive cover on it. It's, it's actually entitled Science Set Free. And he points out that 10 of the most fundamental assumptions of modern science are themselves unscientific and do not stand up to even most basic of scrutinies and I really recommend that book because he, he goes into detail about how the what these assumptions are but they're not based on science they're based on dogma for the most part science has no interest in these things they have no interest in these fields they have no interest in making devices that will detect these fields so here am I with a a pendulum and I'm able to detect some of the fields that are out there and actually to date um, over the last 30 years I have either identified or discovered about a dozen fields that are not in the scientific literature and science has no interest in what they are but it is my intention with as hokey as it looks to take the pendulum and to try to um, log to write to uh, record what I'm finding the physics that are involved how these things work because it may help somebody else in their research so with all this said this brings me up to date with where I left off on the dowsing series because there I was researching the horizontal fields that come off the dowsing rods or the Y sticks and it's simply the tracking field there was nothing um, unusual about it it was easy to work with it was easy to understand but then I started researching the vertical fields that come out of the ground if a person is looking for water or if they're looking for buried treasure or underground pipes or wires or gold, those sorts of things. And the physics and the properties of the vertical fields coming out of the ground were very strange and they actually introduced a whole another series of fields to where I realized I'm going to have to make an entirely different series to, to continue on in the research of these new fields that are being revealed through the, the vertical marker fields that are coming out of the ground. Now, a lot of people speculate that, like with water dowsing, you know, it's obvious that it works because <clears throat> there is history over hundreds of thousands of years, hundreds and thousands of years, that it works. And, and it's been proven that it works, but people speculate, well, maybe it's a, an energy field or magnetism or gravitational pull from the water, <coughs> excuse me, that's coming out of the ground that causes the, uh, the field to be detectable. But I don't think this is the case because a good dowser can go from detecting water to detecting gold or underground pipes. So if it was just the energy field coming out of moving water, then how can he switch and also be successful with dousing these other objects? No, I actually believe that it's uh, not the subconscious of man, but actually the spirit of man 
can travel and and uh, move underground and detect the things that are there because even in scripture it says that the spirit can travel paul told the corinthians he said when you are gathered together and my spirit is among you hand this man this particular man hand him over to satan so the spirit paul's spirit is with his body wherever he's at but his spirit can also remain with his body and also can travel to where the corinthians are at similarly a dowser can project his spirit underground and study and detect uh, the water the quality of water the flow of the water where the streams are where the main main course of the of the water flow is and oftentimes they will set up for themselves a code to try to decipher what their spirit is detecting well they will ask questions like is there potable drinkable water on this property yes or no and their rods will respond with a yes or no uh, preset code as far as how their rods would respond to answer that question um, how deep is it? They'll ask questions about the, the meters of the depth, yes or no, and keep going down until they get a, a yes answer to as far as the depth, uh, as even uh, the amount of the volume, uh, how many gallons per minute, they will get yes and no answers on their rods. And basically what they're doing is just deciphering what their spirit is finding. Now, this may sound like a contradiction in terms because I said that there basically, essentially is no supernatural. Now I'm talking about the spirit of man traveling underground, but this is all part of nature. When God made man in his image and breathed into him the breath of life, the, the, uh, the spirit, that's part of nature, that's part of creation. That's not supernatural. That is as natural as anything else uh, part of nature.